The earth groans, rocks worship, Ezekiel prophesies to the mountains and the valleys. What do these scripture passages mean? Does the earth literally groan? Does it really respond to the prophetic utterances of God's servants? Can any part of creation, besides human beings, worship God? Can the ground we walk on, the ground itself, be blessed or become defiled? Humans and the earth, is there something more to our relationship than just gravity that pulls us together? The first thing we need to look at is the language of the Bible. When God speaks about the earth and gives it human characteristics, is God speaking literally or is he speaking figuratively? There are occasions when God uses metaphors and allegories to communicate truth to us. So when God talks about the earth like it has human-like feelings, is it just a personification? Personification is a poetic device where you ascribe a human characteristic to something that's not human. For example, the wind howled ominously, or the sun beat down showing no mercy. Is the earth groaning? Is God using literary devices to illustrate a point? I don't really think so, and I mean, I really don't, and here's why. When I look at the totality of Scripture, I see reoccurring passages where it's clear the earth really is responding to something. The earth responds, the Bible says. The earth waits, the Bible says. The earth yields, the Bible says. Wouldn't that seem to indicate the earth has some measure of a choice? How is it that, that even the earth has a choice of whether to yield to us or not? Here's a clue. What does the Bible say we're created from? It says we're created from the dust of the earth. The breath of God created the earth, and then God took some of that earth and formed man, and then he breathed again. And Adam, and you and I, came to life. That's where the mystery starts, the mystery of man and the earth. is Dreams and Mysteries with John Paul Jackson. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. If these verses in Romans 8 were just meant to be poetry, they could stand up against the greatest poets of any generation. It has all the makings of a Shakespearean soliloquy. It's beautiful. It's descriptive. It's even emotive. It probably really impressed the church in Rome who might have been used to that sort of thing. But there's another reason Paul uses literary devices like personification. They add value and context. In fact, you and I do this ourselves all the time. You might ask somebody, how was the traffic on the way to work today? And they may respond, goodness, it was like a parking lot. Was traffic really a parking lot? No, but describing it that way, you're able to share in the experience with somebody and the emotions involved in their experience. God talks about the earth as if it's a person in scripture because he wants us to change how we view the earth and our role on it. God's original intent for us and the earth was put on hold when Adam and Eve sinned. But just as everything changed for us through Christ, everything changed for the earth as well. There's a problem. The earth is waiting for us to bring it good news. It's waiting for us to free it from its bondage. If we're supposed to restore the earth to its original purpose, it would probably be helpful to know what that original purpose was. So to do that, we have to look at the structure of man's original relationship with the earth. And here's what you find in Genesis 1. God gave man authority over the earth and told him to subdue it. As man subdued the earth, 
its purpose was fulfilled. In other words, God told Adam, look around you. This garden has order and purpose. This garden is doing what I created it to do. But not all the earth looks like this. So I want you to go and change that. Go and subdue the earth. Make the whole earth look like this. I've done my part. Now it's your turn. We were given authority over the earth to do that, and we were told to to subdue it. And for a while, man did. We're not sure how long Adam and Eve spent subduing the earth, but we do know this. It ended the moment they sinned. Why does God attribute human characteristics to the earth then? One reason is it reminds us of the relationship we once had. What's the purpose for that, you might be asking? Because when Jesus died on the cross, the provision was made to restore man and earth back to their original relationship. If that's the case, then why don't we see radical changes all around us? Why doesn't every believer have an orchard, say, in their backyard and a garden full of vegetables? And you might ask, why do tornadoes and hurricanes decimate homes of Christians and non-Christians alike? Well, a lot's happened in the last 6,000 years, that's for sure. By that I mean a lot, a lot of sin. The earth will respond to the righteous. However, at the same time, it's also responding to the unrighteous. Part of the futility that the, well, you might say part of the futility the earth experiences today is due to a tug of war. That's right, a tug of war. A tug of war between righteousness on one hand and unrighteousness on the other. Here's an illustration of that tug of war. When we moved to New Hampshire, we moved into a house that had very little grass. There were no birds on the property, no animals scurrying about. It was actually kind of strange. Here we were in the middle of the most wooded state in the United States, and our land, though still beautiful, seemed lifeless. We cut down two dozen dead trees in the first two years. Historically, every place my wife and I have lived, the Lord has impressed upon us the basic principle, turn your land into the Garden of Eden. So that's what I wanted to do at my home in New Hampshire. I could have spent a small fortune landscaping to do this, but what I actually did was speak to the land. From the first day I took ownership, right after we signed the contract, we walked the corners of the property and consecrated it with oil and speaking the blessings of God over it. I said, land, we're the new owners. Here we are, we have purchased you, therefore, We give you the right to live, and I command you to live. I said that because at the moment, the land wasn't living. So we commanded the land to live. We spoke to the rest of creation in the area and commanded that creation to come, dwell on our property, and use the land as God created it to be used. Not long after that, literally days or a couple of weeks, that's exactly what began to happen. Falcons, turkeys, chipmunks, groundhog, deer, fox, squirrel, and many other animals returned to our property. We actually had fox have, a, have babies underneath our porch, and that's unheard of. Well, when we first arrived, the land had none of this, but after announcing our presence and blessing the land, creation responded to us being there. We announced who we were and commanded the land to fulfill its purpose. You see, I believe, and I really believe, We have a right to command the earth, especially when we own it. We have paid a price in the natural, and Jesus has paid a price in the spirit. There's also a secondary principle at play, and this is much more of a spiritual principle than a natural one. You see, the earth feels sin, and it has to be healed from it. When my ministry was in New Hampshire, we owned a piece of property called the Pinnacle. It was called the Pinnacle because it was a mountain that was one of the highest points in the area and is even listed on the map. For at least 100 years, it had been a place where the occult met and made sacrifices. The Pinnacle had become defiled. We were literally taking back a high place. And the first thing we did when we took ownership of the property was to cleanse the land of that defilement. We prayed, we worshiped, we took communion, We did everything we knew to restore God's blessings on that property. Even after we owned the land, the witches in the area tried to continue to hold the ceremonies at the top of that mountain. They would build their altars, would tear them down, and throw the stones down the mountain. 
would put up our cross and they would turn it upside down and or destroy it. This went on for a year until eventually they stopped coming. Why did they stop coming? It's like I told my staff, they're gonna stop when they can't communicate with their God anymore. So when we left New Hampshire, I turned the pinnacle over to the church I'd planted, and today the land is thriving. It's an amazing place of worship, and the presence of God rests in an unusually strong way there, even to today. When the righteous take possession of the land and begin restoring it to its original purpose, we're not just turning a neutral force into a positive force, we're stopping the plans of the enemy in that geographic area, and that could start in your apartment or in your house. We're taking land and the, and the natural, and we're taking land and the spiritual as well. We're going to change things if we grab a hold of this concept. The land is waiting for us to subdue it, and to take dominion over it. Learn more about powerful spiritual authority with the Matters of the Earth Bundle. This powerful four CD teaching is filled with practical faith-building strategies you can use to begin using your God-given authority over the earth. The Matters of the Earth Bundle also includes My Journey So Far, a personal testimony from John Paul, this teaching set is being offered for your gift of $45 or more to the ministry. To order this bundle, visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. Now that we've looked at this kind of mysterious passage in Romans 8 about creation groaning, I'd like to go back to the creation account in Genesis. As I mentioned earlier, God did the heavy lifting during the six days of creation. And on the sixth day, that's when he passed the torch to us. Here's how that handover happened in Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seeds to you, it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. The key phrases there is, subdue the earth, and I might add, take dominion over it. Now, the Hebrew word used here for, for subdue is kabosh. You might have heard uh, an old colloquial saying that says, well, they put the kabosh on that. Well, there's a reason, because in this context, it literally means to forcefully control, well, enslavement, actually, that you, it is to be enslaved to you because it's inferior to you. Not inferior in the sense of value, but inferior in the sense of what it's called to do versus what you're called to do. It's very interesting, the word choice here, because it implies that the earth outside of the garden was potentially dangerous. Notice man was put into the garden already subdued. He had to go outside the garden to subdue an unsubdued earth. So kibosh doesn't mean prune or water or speak softly. It means use the authority you have to take full control. That's an awesome power to have. God would only have given that kind of power and authority at that level to someone he could trust, someone who wouldn't use it to do evil. And since we're talking about humans here, that meant someone who didn't even know what evil was. So what did God do? God gave the privilege and power of subduing the earth to Adam and Eve on one condition. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, unfortunately, we know the story. They did that very thing. And once they did, the authority to subdue the earth was revoked. It happened instantly. Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden and was told, you will have to till the soil and toil over your food from then on. A wild earth that no longer responded to them, I might add, is where they were sent out to. In fact, in a way, just as they had become slaves to sin, they also became slaves to the earth. Why? 
because now darkness ruled over the earth. The enemy, Satan, ruled over the earth and had submitted to him. They now had to serve the earth to receive the benefits of its fruit. And that service, again, was called toil. Fruit that was once fruit on demand now became the fruit of their labor. I believe we have an amazing opportunity to regain the type of relationship we had with the earth before sin. It won't be exactly the same because we're still part of a fallen world, but we can reveal ourselves to creation as a son and a daughter of God. And in doing so, we can set it free from its bondage. Jesus bore all our sins on the cross, and through salvation and a repentant lifestyle, we are righteous before Him. Because of this, the earth will respond to our righteousness if we let it. So how does this work practically? And I want to make it practical because I don't want it to seem so mystical and enchanted that you don't feel like, it, you, like you could really do it yourself. Uh, what I do is I really believe the principles in the Bible from the beginning to the end. So here's how it works with me. I spiritually take authority over every place I dwell. I believe that that's been shown to us from the Garden of Eden. Every place I've ever lived, I want to make it better than when I moved in. My home, my office, my car, the airplane seat that I paid a fee to ride in. I don't think it's silly, nor do I think it's trite, nor do I think it's superstitious. I really believe it's biblical principles that are applied to everyday life. I don't even do this as if some sort of symbolic prophetic act is taking place, although I really do believe there's a place for prophetic acts, and we're going to be seeing more of that in the future. Anyway, anything I own, I want cleansed through the blood of Jesus. Any time or anything I'm temporarily renting something, like a hotel room, I want it set apart for at least the time I'm in it for righteousness because I'm in that hotel room, probably speaking at a church or a conference, to change the earth and bring His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Here's what I'm declaring by doing this. I basically tell the earth to listen to me, just in case there's any confusion. I let the earth know I am a child of the living God. And I tell creation to wait. Their wait is over. I tell it that its wait for for the Son of God, the sons of God to be made manifest, it's over. And I tell them, I'm here to set you free from your bondage. I'm here to set you free from your futility. Now be subdued and align with the kingdom of God. I want to encourage you right now to begin exercising your biblical authority over the earth. It's waiting to help you. And again, it's not silly. It's not super t superstitious, it's really the Bible. In your home, your business, in your child's school, announce to creation that a son or daughter of God is present. Then watch as the supernatural atmosphere begins to shift. The earth will begin responding to your righteousness. You'll help it reach the purpose for which it was created, and in so doing, it will help you reach the purpose for which you were created. There's something in the air. I'm scared because I'm not sure what is happening. There were militant groups that were going around the area. I have a gun and I'm, I'm prepared to survive, but I feel very uneasy. I realized that the air was poisoned. I knew I needed a specific type of urban warfare equipment and garb in order to deal with the atmosphere. I'm checking people and, and trying to see if they'll wake up but they're dead. I'm at work. I'm trying to leave, but the roads are closed, so I run back to my office. I call my wife to tell her that I'm not sure how or when I'll get home. Daniel, the prophet, and uh, 
an exile who was taught dreams and visions from God at the same time went through all the Chaldean processes of learning how to be a magi, how to uh, work through all the Chaldean, all the mystical type of stuff that were on the dark side of things. He had to learn that as well because he was, he was brought up in the Babylonian society that taught those things. Never forsake, never forsake his, his relationship with the one true God, but at the same time learned uh, about what the others were being taught. But Daniel gives us a real clear illustration of something that I believe refers to this dream, and that is night visions. Sometimes just because we have something that happens to us at night, we think it's a dream. But the true definition of a dream and a vision is not that a dream happens at night and a vision happens in the day. It's that one is more literal and one is more symbolic. When you take a look at the visions and dreams in Scripture, you find Dreams in Scripture were always full of symbolism, and visions in Scripture were always full of the more literal. It's almost like what you see is what you get. Here we have an illustration of what the person would interpret as a, a dream, but the reality is it's more of a vision. It's more of a literal event. And this literal event is actually telling something very parallel to what we're talking about today in the mystery of man and the earth. And that's this, that when the earth becomes more violent, men become more violent. The, the truth is, is that when man fails to subdue the earth like he was supposed to subdue the earth, then the earth begins to show the effects of that and mankind begins to show the effects of that as well. And here is the outgrowth of that. Something is in the air. Now that says the earth, even the earth is recognizing something and he's picking up on what the earth is doing. Something is in the air. He has a gun with him. And why would, why would he be carrying that? Because something is in the air. It probably has been in the air for quite some time. Calls his wife, doesn't know when he can get home. He's at work, he's trying to leave. The roads are closed. He ends up going back to his office. All of these things say, that when there's anarchy in the earth, there's anarchy in the people. When there's anarchy in the people, there's anarchy in the earth. When the righteous rule, the scripture says, the people rejoice. But when the unrighteous rule, the people languish. This is an evidence of something happening where righteousness is not ruling. And the result is people languish. And usually when people languish, violence is the outgrowth of that languish. So, it's a warning dream. And the warning dream basically is not telling him, carry a gun. The warning dream is saying that there's a time coming if men don't change, if righteousness doesn't rule, when mankind and creation are going to exhibit turbulence in their relationships, and turbulence in society, and turbulence in the earth. So it's a dream that goes along with what we're talking about today. And it's a dream, or a vision, I should say, that needs to be faced with the sobriety and yet at the same time with the confidence that following God will produce righteousness, following God will produce the earth rejoicing. Not following God produces the opposite. That's one of the reasons why we want His kingdom to come and His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So righteousness rules. That's a good thing. Over the last 30 years, John Paul Jackson has studied how God speaks metaphorically through dreams, parables, and proverbs in the Bible. God wants all believers to understand their dreams, and that includes you. For your gift of $60 or more, we'd like to send you the Essentials of Dreams Bundle. This bundle includes a two CD set teaching the basics of dreams and visions, John Paul's advanced six CD set, Essentials of Dreams and Visions, and a three CD set on the biblical model of dream interpretation. Also included, the Moments with God Dream Journal, plus four dream cards to help you understand your dreams. Order your Essentials of Dreams bundle today 
visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. You want to learn the deeper mysteries of God, but feel overwhelmed with your schedule. Introducing John Paul's online classroom. Attend his classes without leaving your home, fitting your lifestyle. Explore subjects like dream interpretation, hearing from God, living the spiritual life, prayer and spiritual warfare. Watch and take notes with your 200-page companion study guide. To begin your journey, go to dreamsandmysteries.com and click on John Paul's online classroom or call 1-800-538-5285. The earth is longing to help you advance the kingdom. It's eagerly awaiting on you to carry out your role as a son or daughter of God. Do you fully understand what that means? It means God loved us so much that he kept creation waiting until our righteousness was restored at the cross. Just as he watched his son endure the insults and humiliation of wicked men, he's watched the earth endure the same insults of sin, bloodshed, and injustice. The earth is ready to respond. It's ready to enter the battle with you. You may be saying to yourself, well, John Paul, I don't don't even own land. I live in an apartment on the third floor, and the closest I get to the garden is when I sweep up the dirt at my front door. Well, here's what I say to you. All of creation speaks of him. All of creation will sing his praises. If you don't have mountains and valleys to prophesy to, then the four walls of your apartment will do. Tell them to forget the strife that happened before you moved in. Tell them they're set free of the sin they've been forced to witness and the profane words that have been spoken before you took possession. Tell the four walls of your apartment that you're now part of the kingdom of God and tell them that they are also part of that kingdom. Tell them to take notice that a son or daughter of God now lives here. Then move to every part of your home inside those four walls and declare the same thing. And as you consecrate it by touching the walls and doors and windows with oil, just like the priest did in the tabernacle, they touched every element of the tabernacle with oil. You can do the same thing at work, right there at your desk, or even in your vehicle as you're driving. Do this over every part of creation you have authority over. You can even bless the public property that your tax dollars go to maintain and create. Proclaim these things as you walk around your children or your grandchildren's school. All of these actions advance the kingdom and make your surroundings more like heaven. You may never see a physical manifestation of that taking place, but you will feel a sense and a shift in the spiritual atmosphere in each of those places. I've watched it play out in my own life to the point that now it's become second nature to me. Remember? God has already done all the heavy lifting in the garden, at the cross, right now in your own home. He's saying, I've shown you the plan. I've given you the authority. Now make it on earth as it is in heaven. 